Uh, so we're going to talk about the OWASP Security Shepherd project. Uh, hands up if anyone's heard of it before? OK, that's good. Uh, I'd, I'd like, I'd, I would have heard of everyone did, but that's, that's why we're here. We want to we get this project out there. We want more people contributing. We want more people using it. Um, so this is a start about where this project came from and where myself and Sean have come from. Uh, so my name is Mark Dennehan. Uh, I went to college in Dublin, the Dublin Institute of Technology. And uh, I, in my course, I had an internship stream and uh, went straight into uh, IBM. Now, first off, everything I say is my own opinion. Same as Sean, his opinion. Nothing to do with our employers. Uh, disclaimer there in the slide as well. But uh, I did the internship stream through my course, and I was lucky enough to secure an internship in IBM. So I was there two days a week for two years, and uh, my boss, Jason Flood, was training me in pen testing. Now, my, I don't know how you guys were trained in pen testing, if any of you have been, but mine was like a baptism through fire. A lot of, uh, a lot of headaches leaving, a lot of, lot, lot, lot of concentration going on, and it was difficult. And the resources out there are really for people who not really there for students. They're kind of people who are already well-established, understand all the terminology, and you're just touching up. So I, I had a hard time learning, learning it. So uh, when it came to my get, sorting out final year project for my, uh, for my course, I thought about taking everything I'd learned and squashing it into an application. Uh, and that's where Security Shepherd uh, has come from. And uh, Sean? Hi, my name is Sean. I went for the uh, more academic approach. I didn't uh, do internship. Uh, I was a year behind Mark. I needed a final year project. Mark provided an idea. He wanted to expand to the mobile levels, so uh, I started work on that. So initially, I started off by developing one app, and I wanted to have um, multiple levels based off that one vulnerable app, vulnerable in many different ways. But then it came clear that would be a better idea to sort of have one app per level. So um, I created it like that. OK, so um, security share. So I don't know if anyone went to Jacob West's keynote at the start of today. Uh, he mentioned that the top nine courses, in computing, computer science courses in the colleges in the USA uh, don't cover security properly. And uh, when I went to college, which isn't that long ago, it's only two or three years, they didn't teach application security at all. It was only crypto. And uh, if, if you wanted to, you could do some sort of forensic work. And uh, even still today, I know that the uh, DIT are starting to introduce application security because they're using Security Shepherd now. But uh, it's, it's kind of a rarity to see. And uh, there's we wanted, to, we wanted to fill that gap, because uh, there, there were other projects that kind of tried to do it, but not the way that we wanted to. So Security Shepherd stack is pretty simple. We just run off Tomcat. Uh, you can use any application server you want. But we're really I was really impressed with Tomcat. Uh, the biggest instance I've run, biggest workshop I've run for Security Shepherd has been with 1,700 users. Of, uh, obviously not in one room, but uh, 1,700 users. So it, uh, it's pretty much with default settings, with some SSL enabled, stuff like that. Uh, we use MySQL for the database. We're utilizing a SAPI for, uh, for the encoder to make sure we haven't got any uh, cross-site scripting where we, where we don't want it. We're also using anti-SAMI for some of our levels. We've got bad implementations of anti-SAMI. We've ripped out some of its functionality. And we also use it to detect cross-site scripting because where we can, everything in Security Shepherd is an actual vulnerability. But the, its, it's uh, damage has been limited. So you can't take an SQL injection level and use it to compromise the platform, because you're, you're doing it as a user that only has privileges to the level. So everything's real, except they've been limited. So, uh, but in some instances, like cross-site scripting, short of virtualizing a, virtualizing a browser on the server, we can't actually, detect, we can't actually make it real. So we, we detect that with Antisami. So, uh, so the way we approach Security Shepherd, for someone who's uh, been a student and is learning uh, with pen testing, uh, or if you're giving workshops to students, you might find they don't actually know anything about the language. So let's say you're trying to teach SQL injection, you're giving a demo, and you realize that five out of the 50 students you have don't actually know uh, MySQL because they don't bother going to the classes, or they don't know SQL. So we give them a whole lot of information in a lesson. The first time you, the first time you encounter a subject, you're given a whole load of information. You can see there's piles of it there, and it's written in layman's terms so that any student is going to be able to understand this. And after you've read the lesson, there's a small challenge. It's just at the bottom there. We'll walk through some challenges later on. But there's a small, small challenge that pretty much tells you how to do it. So put in or 1 equals 1 here, and you're going to get the whole database table. Now, the reason why uh, this is different is because after this lesson, further on in the game, there's challenges that build. Okay, there's a little less help. And a little less help again, another bad fix. Okay, so that's. Uh, 
So I want to talk about how dynamic the platform is. Before we start looking at it from a student's point of view, let's look at it from an uh, administrator's point of view. So I wrote this in DIT, I wrote it for my final year project, and to make it really appealing to my supervisor, it was written as a, to be used in colleges. So that, that's where the whole platform was geared originally. So the first thing uh, that admins can do is just cheat sheets. So let's say you're, you're teaching a class of uh, hip young kids and you, you don't really, you're not too sure. You don't want to be shown up in front of them. You can actually just enable cheat sheets and work through the application yourself. It's going to give you everything you need to, go to, to, to do to go through it. Now let's say you want to, as well as that, you can also uh, modify the cheat sheets so they're less interesting, le less, less help. Uh, just, just the tips they might need. So maybe a week before their assignments due, you can enable them. Uh, as for module, module management, uh, we've got a whole lot of stuff. If you look here in this previous slide, we've got lessons. Then it's actually, I'll just open up a browser. So uh, this, is, this is the way we're going to show Shepard. I'll just show you as it goes. So at the moment, it's in a capture flag kind of style. Because originally we had it as a, you can just do it in any order you want, kind of similar to how WebGoat does it. But uh, we realize it's not very engaging. If you sit in a room of students or you just give them free reign, they're just going to get bored. Uh, they'll, they'll have everything they can possibly do. They're just going to get sick and tired of it. They're not going to do it. So what we started doing instead was we had it in a CTF kind of uh, layout. So they get one challenge at a time. And to progress through it, they get one challenge and they, they, move, they move through it to unlock the next challenge and the next challenge after that. Uh, so you can have it that way, but if you wanted to, you can change it to an open floor plan. So then if I refresh the page, you'll see I've got all the lessons I want, and I can go through all the challenges that, uh, that come up. So you can see we've got, we've got loads of content in there. So what else can we do? I'm just going to enable CTF mode again there. This is a, a live instance of Shepard, actually, if anyone wants to give it a go. We're running, a, we're running this over the internet, so if you go to uh, oas.securityshepherd.eu, you can uh, have a go at the latest version of Security Shepherd uh, uh, in, the, in the exciting CTF uh, platform. So uh, what else can we do here? Uh, we can enable module blocks. So in the CTF mode, it's one level at a time. It's a little bit more interesting. But let's say you want to stop people when they get to level eight, because you want to walk through that one with them so they really understand it. You can just enable a block, and they won't get past that. They'll be told to get a coffee or something. What else can we do here? So, we can open and close modules by their categories. Let's say we don't want to touch off CSRF. Maybe we, that's going to be too complex for my students. They can't do it. So we can just turn all those levels off. We can gear the experience to exactly what we want to teach. We only want to touch off XSS, or we only want to do mobile issues. We can just disable everything else with a click. Uh, we can enable feedback. And uh, this gets used a lot uh, when you've got your students doing this. You don't want them to be cheating off each other. So what you can do is, um, well, you, you don't want them cheating off each other uh, anyway, but you can, uh, let's say you want them to do write-ups. You, you want them to talk about the issue to make sure they understand it. You can enable feedback so that they put their write-up in the end of each level, and then the admin can just look at it. Easy as pie. So, sorry guys. As well as that, if you're running a workshop, it's kind of difficult to read the room sometimes. Um, sorry, a few progress. It's kind of difficult to read the room sometimes and hard to tell who's lagging behind. So you can just get the progress and see how people are doing. So we've got three people on the live instance at the moment. One guy's on five modules, one guy's on one. If this was in a lab and we were running it together, I could just run over to the guy who's done nothing because obviously he's got stuck on the first level. And now I can just walk him through it. And you can kind of keep the pace of the whole room up by just targeting your help at the right people. You don't want to be helping the winners because they don't need it. Okay, so user management, this is, uh, there's loads of stuff in here. You can create admins, upgrade, upgrade people to admins, add mass amounts of players at a time. If you want to, uh, if you want, you can close registration. So you can only have a very specific amount of users. You can just throw in, throw in all, your, all your class, and then only they can sign in. If people hit this, they won't be able to register, and then they can't get into the application. Okay, and then there's configuration as well, just uh, for setting uh, your DB credentials if it's non-standard and all those sort of things. So let's talk about it from, the, user, from the, the user's experience. So every time you complete a level, you get some points. The levels at the start are really, really easy uh, because it kind of picks up in pace, as we talked about. I think the first levels are worth 10 points. 
Max, if you finish level first, you get some bonus points. So all of a sudden you're ahead of the game. Works out about five bonus points for first place, four for second. Goes on that way. But once you throw this up on the board, people become really, really competitive. I've seen best friends hate each other instantly. Uh, it's, it's, really it's really interesting how gamific gamification really entices students. And once, once that's up there, they're all of a sudden, it's not about learning anymore. It's about screwing over that guy. Uh, and it's, it's, it is really cool. You do see people trying to, uh, to help their friends, though. And it's, it's sweet, but it, they're, not learning, they're not really learning. So uh, what, what we have is, in any level where there's not a hard-coded key, you know, and some we have to have hard-coded keys, like SQL injection, the database has a key in it. We can't generate that at, at when, the, when the user gets it. But in anything else, we have a user-specific keys. So your user, your, your, the base key, which is completely random, is encrypted with uh, the user's username and their key that they don't know. So if you give your key to somebody else, it won't work. And we'll know that you gave your key to them. And then if you want to penalize plagiarism, you can. But if you put in enough bad submissions, you're going to get docked 10% of your points anyway. So g gamification really works very well. And we kind of, uh, I, did a, I did a lot of work with the HoneyNet last year, the HoneyNet project in Dublin. And uh, we ran a lot of CTFs last year. And we used the Security Shepherd platform for this because you know, it already, it already supported a scoring system, and it, I built it robust. I, I was pretty sure it was going to hold up. And uh, we ran it at AppSec Ireland in 2012, and it ran fine. Uh, then we stepped it up. Uh, Fabio Serlio helped us out and got us, got us a gig to run the OWASP LATAM uh, CTF. It was an online tour. And uh, I think we had about 600 users, and we, I think we had 200 gigabytes of application logs. It was hammered so much. And we weren't hacked, which was a, which was a great story for us. Uh, AppSec EU, slightly less users, but the same, uh, same amount of impact. And the global CTF as well. I don't know if any of you guys saw that. That was used using the Security Shepherd platform. Uh, we also use, use it in some uh, on-prem CTFs in Source in Dublin, Facebook last year, and then Iris the last couple of years. This is just for managing the levels. It just hands out the levels. That's all it does. And what myself and John were talking about was that there's no real projects out there for uh, if you want to create a CTF, it takes a lot of work because you're, you're, I'm sure the guys inside have put in loads of planning into not being hacked themselves. I, I haven't been in, but I'm sure, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they have because I've done this sort of stuff. So why isn't there a project out there that will just enable you to take your CTF levels, just plug them in, and then you're running a CTF and you're not going to be damaged? So the Security Shepherd platform is becoming, is being forked into it just to do that as well. So let, let's, let's dig into uh, some some levels. So has anyone ever tried to teach CSRF to a student? No? Yeah? Is it difficult? Yeah, they don't get it. It's, it's, really, it's really bloody hard. So, um, see it? so I think that what we do for CSRF is kind of unique. So here's the application. We're signed in. Everything on the home page. Tells them how to play the game. Tells them how to get their next levels. So to start off, you can see I'm signed as attacker mark. To start off, all I need to do is click Get Next Challenge. Now, this isn't the way that the levels are ordered for uh, the normal game. This is just for the demo. But the first one is CSRF. And we can see there's an unholy amount of help there. CSRF is pretty difficult to understand, so there's got to be loads of help. So we can hide all that. And this is the challenge I was talking about, to get past just the lesson. So we can see there's loads of help. And pretty much, it's pretty much a jigsaw. The pieces you needed are highlighted. And the objective of this challenge is to CSRF an admin. Now, this isn't real. This is simulated. Because with CSRF, you don't know when your attack's going to execute. So for the lesson, we decided it needed to be an immediate response telling them if it worked or not. So it's a simulated attack. So you CSRF the admin with an image. It worked. You got your user-specific key. OK, that's just, that's just the lesson. OK, and no student reads the, reads the lesson. They just skip it. To be honest, what you kind of find is the students decide, do you know what, I'm just going to throw in all this information and just get, through the, just, get, just get through the level. They do it with nearly everything. They just do. Um, I did it, I'm sure. So what we have to do is we need to reinforce what they've learned with a, with a, with a challenge. And 99% of the time, they always go back to the lesson and learn, re read that little bit to get them through this bit. So you can see uh, here's a form where players can submit their own images. 
And we can see victim Sean's already put in a, a, a meme there. So what we're going to do now is instead we're going to put in our CSRF attack for this level. So it's, we, can, we have the path there, so we throw it in. And then our user ID instead of example ID. So the idea here is that this is, this is an actual real vulnerability here. Uh, the, to, to pass this level, there's a function that just signs it completed for you. And anyone can call this except yourself. OK, so you need to CSRF someone else, else to sign the level completed for you. So we're signed in here as victim Sean. And he's already completed all the levels. So we're going to go to CSRF1, which we just did. And he's loaded the page. And there's attacker Mark's image. I've CSRF them. Now when I go back to my browser and refresh the page, my next challenge is, isn't going to be CSRF1 anymore. It's going to be CSRF2. Super. Now, that's kind of, it's been pretty easy so far. We're just using image tags. It's not that involved. We're going to step it up a little bit now where there's iframes for the users instead. And it's a post request instead of a get request. Now, for you and me, a post request. It's just a HTML file. But for a student, they're tearing their hair out. They don't know what to do. They have to go back to the lesson again and read about the post request part. So all we need is a HTML page. I've got one prepped. There we are. Um, it, it, just, it just forces the browser to send the request. So I, I've got that on Dropbox. So I've, uh, I'm going to just put the Dropbox link in there, post a message. And we'll see when it loads up here, it's going to say increment failed. Because I can't increment my own CSRF counter. I need someone else to do it. OK, this is another real issue. It needs to be well formed for it to work. So Sean signs in, CSRF2, and we can see the increment was successful there. He signed it. Okay, so we're building slowly for the students, okay? Uh, they, they, they do get this. Uh, it's, it's the best way to teach them CSRF, in my experience. It's better than any talk, anyway. So now we've got them doing very simple CSRF. What, if, what about now bad fixes? Okay, so the next challenge I'm going to talk about is CSRF Challenge 4. So uh, we can see that it's another post request. And we've got an example ID. But this time, there's a CSRF token that needs to be in the request as well. So let's, let's actually have a look at this. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to update our, uh, attack, our attack so that we have a CSRF in there as well. I'm just going to throw in 0 because we need, just don't want it to be null. So new tab, hitting my own page. And here's a request going to the server. It's just token equals zero. Heading to oas.securitysherver.eu. And we can see the increment failed. Okay? We'd expect that. We can't do it to ourselves. But let's dig into it a little bit further. We can see that I'm actually sending it to the wrong place. It should be CSRF4. So we click go. And in the response, we can see no CSRF detected for this challenge. Your token is now one. One is a really shitty CSRF token. I think we can all agree. So, and the more we dig into this with, with new sessions, we can see that there's actual predict, really, really easy to predict all the ones. There's two, there's one, and there's zero. And if you do it enough, you realize they're the only possible CSRF tokens for this level. So now, the, now your student needs to step up a little bit. They're not just sending one request. To guarantee they solve this level, they need to send, make your browser send multiple post requests to ensure they're going to pass the level. So we can see there's our, there's our attack vector. And when we load it up as victim Sean, we can see, boom, two of them failed, one of them worked. OK, so that's, that's how we teach CSRF with, uh, with Security Shepherd. Now, I challenge anyone to, to, to improve on that, because I, I can't think of a better way to show it. Uh, CSRF is the most difficult thing for students to understand. And when they've gone through it on that, they're actually capable. They understand it. They know that they need tokens. They know that they need random tokens. And as the, as the levels go on, they know that they need to have secure uh, non-storage. And you can't be able to get other people's nonsense. So I'm going to hand over to Sean, because Sean specialized in making all the mobile uh, content for Security Shepherd. OK, so um, when I was putting together the mobile content for Security Shepherd, I decided to call the apps Mobile Shepherd. Um, the biggest challenge was how to deliver these apps. I could provide them to the user individually, so I could upload them to the Android market, but you'd have to download all these applications individually. And they were too singular in purpose to be on the market anyway. 
Uh, secondly, like they, people would have to set up the Android SDK, and maybe not everybody who takes part in these challenges is an Android developer. Thirdly, the Android emulator, in my opinion, isn't great. It's kind of slow, so that's also not a viable option. So what I decided to do was I, uh, I looked out, did some research, and I found the Android x86 project. It releases um, an open source Android VM regularly. So what I've done is I have created my levels, I've released and signed them, and I've loaded them onto the Android x86 project. All you have to do is download a VirtualBox image and import into VirtualBox, and then you have the environment for Mobile Shepherd set up. So I'm gonna go over some of the lessons I have already. So this is what it looked like to start. Insecure Dados, lesson number one. So we got a username and login. The vulnerabil vulnerability isn't here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look elsewhere. As you can see, the account is locked. So the target here is an administrator account. So Alt F1 throws up the command line interface and we go to the data directory where all the apps are usually stored. So we identify, we, we see them all there and we identify the one we're looking for which is IDS, Insecure Data Storage. So whenever you're using a database in an app, a folder called databases will be generated and the DB files will be there. So usernames and passwords are all stored in the DB file and as you can see, the admin password is in plain text. So there it is there, battery 777. And that is also the key to pass the level. It's important to remember that all these levels that Sean's walking through have, have uh, when you load them from the web app, there's descriptions on what you need to do. Yep. Uh, client side injection. This is a uh, client side injection part one. So you can't really attack the database in this instance because it's been encrypted, but the, there, is a, there is a username and login and that's vulnerable to injection. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna escape input throw in an OR, a condition which is always equal to true, and comment out the rest of the statement. And we're logged in, and that's the key there. I've tried to keep my keys sort of more readable and a bit more short, so if you're passing data between the emulator, or sorry, the virtual machine and the web app, you sometimes maybe you can't copy and paste, so it's just quick to type them out. So this is uh, reverse engineering. We're gonna skip to a challenge in this one because we've already gone over how to reverse engineer an Android app with the users in this. So we've used dex to jar to turn it into a jar file and we're opening the jar file now and we can see that there's a key check. Now there isn't a hard coded key there which the user would have been looking for beforehand. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify the key check function. We're gonna extract it and we're gonna add it into our own Java program. And from there we're gonna run it and see what it outputs. We compile it and there we go, there's the key. So this is a follow up from lessons previously where we would go over how to actually reverse engineer the Android app. And the first thing you're getting is simply a hard coded string. We carry on from there, go to challenge one. The string is hidden somewhere, it's been obfuscated. And then finally challenge three there was the key wasn't technically in the app in the source code, but there was a function which would check the valid validity of the key and you could use that to find out what the key was. So just, uh, just to go over that, that was um, Insecure Data Storage 3. We go, Insecure Data Storage, we go over all this on the web app, there's a massive explanation, and like I'm, I mean, it may look like I'm just flying through some command line interface stuff there, but it's all explained the web app, the commands, the directories, why apps do this, it's, uh, it, it was very easy to integrate like mobile applications into Security Shepherd. All I had to do was just generate a JSP page and an insert statement for the SQL core file we had, and that was it. Um, back to the client side injection issue there. That was the query we used. I noticed when I was uh, learning Android application development, a lot of textbook examples didn't take security at all into consideration, and that was a good and bad thing. Good in that, I could use those examples as examples of insecure code in my apps, but also I had to look elsewhere for examples or guidance to create secure applications. 
One, one, uh, one actually good source of information was the OWASP uh, mobile security project, particularly the top 10 mobile risks. And with them, I was able to sort of identify how my apps could be vulnerable in ways that I didn't intend. And finally, uh, hard-coded uh, strings as well was another thing that I based reverse engineer off. So what we've shown you, we, we're kind of, we kind of, the last presentation ran a little bit, a little bit over, uh, so we kind of squashed all that into a slightly shorter period than we originally planned. But that's just a snippet of all the cover topics that we do cover. Uh, Security Shepherd covers um, all the OWASP top 10 uh, web, web application risks, and we're expanding it to cover all of the mobile risks, yeah. covering about 60% now? 60%. So uh, we're, we're, we're really pushing development, but what we really want is help. Uh, if anyone would like to contribute, if anyone would like to contribute, um, we'd, uh, we'd, lo we'd love you to. Uh, even if it's just ideas, what we really struggle with now is because we have about 50 levels overall across the uh, application, starting from novice uh, to apprentice, all the way up to it'll be challenging for you guys, uh, the experts. Okay, it's, 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 it's fun for all the family. But uh, what we really struggle with is we need more ideas. Uh, we need more bad fixes. So uh, what, what, even if you send us an email saying, I saw this awful application that was using some weird encoding thing, and that, that, that was uh, the key to all the server encryption, or something like that, something, sim something simple that you might see every day in your job, that's really what we need. We need fuel for our fire to build more levels, because we want to we make this uh, covers the whole spectrum. If we have uh, any sort of .NET developers or uh, iPhone developers, we'd love to expand uh, the risks to cover iPhone and Windows as well, because even though the, the, the risks are the same, we, we want to we expand our topic coverage. So uh, please join the mailing list. We need you. Email me. It's mark.denhan at os.org. Uh, so that's, that's us, guys. Uh, have we got any questions? Yes. Uh, we're a similar project called Avast Web Goal. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, uh, why did you remake WebGo? Yeah, so um, when I was learning security, uh, security uh, WebGo was kind of a really dated uh, application, and all of the vulnerabilities in it were simulated. And I'd used WebGo in, in workshops, and some of the levels didn't work, some of the levels did work, and they weren't really, they didn't really follow a, a, a curve like Security Shepherd does. It kind of, just this is, this is what the issue is, and this is what the issue is. It doesn't build with bad fixes. It kind of just, it, it's, it's a great platform for getting to understand the concepts, but this, this is built to be a better version. I'm asking because, you know, there is uh, a, a lot of open source projects, and then at the same time, all of them need new developers and so on. Yeah. Everybody great. Each the, 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 real, the, the, real, the real nail in the coffin for me not to have expanded WebGoat instead was that I needed a final year project from my undergrad, and I couldn't expand someone else's project. So I built this. And then after I built this, it, it was such a polished tool, so just, just uh, fresh blood that I, I, I released it as a project. That's really why it exists. But I, 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 I web, WebGoat's in, uh, in, in development as well. It's, it's, if anything, it's healthy competition. Question, uh, do you have, uh, does your project have affinity to localization or translation or something like that? Not at the moment, but we would absolutely love developers to help us do that. I think, I'm pretty sure you just volunteered. The question was if we, ha if we supported uh, multiple languages. Not yet, but I'll talk to you afterwards, okay? In the pub, a couple of points, good, good stuff. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. The question was, is it possible to put your own content in Security Shepherd? Um, yes, it absolutely is. At the moment, it's a slightly more involved process than I would like. Uh, Sean was just talking about it there. You just need to make a, uh, if you have your own, let's say it's a downloadable Java file, you need to be reverse engineered. Then you just need to make a JSP page that points to it and describe, talks about it. Uh, if it's more involved, maybe it's, it's actually, it's a web application risk. There's a couple more steps that are needed, but there, there is wikis on the, our GitHub to help you do that. So uh, email me and I'd, I'd love to help you plug it in. And we want that process to get even easier. So feedback on that process would be great because we want to make the, the, 
CTF framework that it's literally just the easiest thing to throw all your content in. Any other questions? Okay, everyone's hungry? Lunch time's, <laughs> lunch time's coming up. <laughs> Thanks guys, if anyone gets a chance, please check out uh, oas.securityshepherd.eu and uh, have, a, have a play. You might learn something.